as we um, embark again in a new year <coughs> and endeavoring to do what God wants to be done in this particular city and the commission that God has given to us. It's a very simple commission, but I would like for us to, again, vi revisit it and understand the place and the part that God would have us to play. If you go in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28, we have been given a divine commission. And that divine commission involves each and every one of us. We were talking last night about the disciples. And when the disciples were baptizing and individuals were joining the church, they were joining with the sense of themselves being disciples. They joined the church with the intent to further and push forward the banner of Christ. It was not with the intent of just occupying a place in the pew, but the, the, the influence of the testimony of truth that they heard inspired in them that they too had a work to do in forwarding the banner of Christ in their homes and places round about them. Each and every one of us has an influence. When the scriptures talks about the body of Christ and the spirit of God being given to the body of Christ and it wants to work the body of Christ is not just speaking about the minister. It is not speaking about the teacher or the evangelist or the, uh, the prophet or the apostle, but all are to have their place and weight in moving forward in moving the body of Christ and the work of God forward in the earth. All of us have a part to play. The, 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 the crippling effect has been, is because emphasis is only placed upon positions in the church. If someone is not occupying a particular position or a particular office, then it is not looked upon them. Their, their contribution to the work is not looked upon as important as the person who occupies the desk. There's something for all of us to do. We all can't do the same thing, but there's something for all of us to do. And there, we each of us have an influence. There are people in our workspaces that we can influence with our lifestyle, which is a demonstration of the gospel. Our life should have a telling effect upon those who we associate with the most. They should see something in us. They should see the gospel as it were, as a, I, I, I use this cryptic example, almost as a flesh eating disease in a sense. The gospel should be eating away at our carnal natures. It should be destroying it. And so people should be able to look at us and see immediately that the gospel is having a, an effect. It is having an inroad in our lives. Are we together? Amen. Not to belittle uh, uh, what disease does. Yet the gospel, one preacher says that we should spread the gospel like the flu. We should just sneeze it on everybody. Everybody that we come in contact should be affected by what has affected us. And if the gospel is affecting us, then it should be affecting everybody that we encounter in some form or fashion. And this is why when the deacons were chosen, this is why Paul Peter says, or oh, the, uh, the brethren said of the criteria, it says they must have an honest report. They must have, in other words, it's not just them coming together and someone selecting them, but, do, but is there an honest report about them? How does everybody else feel about them? What has been their influence in the society around? Or 
Are they like Ishmael? You know what the Bible says about Ishmael. Ishmael said his hand was against every man and every man's hand was against him. Well, no, we don't need Ishmael. But what is the influence of this person? Paul says, as, as, as lieth within us, as much as is life within us, we need to live peaceably with all men. Doesn't mean that every man is going to be at peace with you. But as a follower of Christ, you can be at peace with everybody else. Because there's a peace that God gives that passeth all understanding. They were cursing at Jesus at the foot of the cross, but he wasn't cursing back. Father, forgive them. They have no idea what they're doing. Living peaceably with all men. So the commission that God has given to us, it, it needs to be reestablished among us as a people, as a whole, because so many things within have occupied us to the point that we're neglecting those without. We're neglecting those without and we are placing more emphasis on people who themselves can go and read and study and pray rather than trying to figure out how can we get before those who need to be affected by the truth. How often have we seen people or congressmen and, and, and civil rights leaders coming together talking about societal problems, wanting to figure out, well, how can we stop the gang violence? Well, you're not going to stop it here in this fancy hotel with cameras talking to people dressed in suits because these are not the ones necessarily shooting each other. How about we shut the cameras down and we go to the people who are being affected by the violence? But we come together and we talk about solving problems among people who really don't have the problem per se. We need to be out there with those who are being infected by what we see happening in society. So this is why, as we understand the commission, we start to think, how can I get among the individuals who are, quote unquote, creating these problems in society that, make, that is making life for me so difficult? Why is it that I can't be in public and talk about Jesus? It is because the people out there are making rules and laws that prohibits that. But if I was among them and I was able to influence them, then maybe what I am doing and saying will influence the decisions and the laws that they pass. Are you with me? I'm not telling us to go to the voting box, but we have to be able to influence those who are passing the laws. Watch this. Notice we're in Matthew 28. Matthew chapter 28, and let's look here at verse 16. Matthew 28, and we're looking at verse 16. We're not neglecting the fact that in Christ given this commission, the disciples had gone through a disappointment. They had come to the, the, the point of the cross, and their, their, their hopes were disappointed. They expected Jesus to do something for the denomination that he did not intend to do. Like today, people are expecting something to happen among the, denom among the denominated people of Seventh-day Adventists that the spirit of prophecy and the Bible does not indicate is going to happen. Amen. And so as we're getting closer to what people are looking at as a national Sunday law, it doesn't seem as though the effect that everyone is waiting and I don't say everybody, the the what in some circles they are preaching for that they believe is going to happen. And we're getting closer and closer to a national Sunday law and it's not happening. Many people, again, are going to be disappointed because they're expecting something. They're expecting this great revival to take place and they're taking they're waiting for this. Uh, uh, this rushing wind to rush through the church and all of a sudden everyone rises up and all of a sudden they come together and then they go on and start preaching and once again the world is going to look at us and say wow these are some great people but it doesn't appear as though anything like that is happening and so they have gone through this great disappointment as it were 
Their, their minds are still frazzled. Even though Jesus has died, they saw him die. He was resurrected and they have fellowship with him. They talk with him, but even still their minds are still a little frazzled because they're still expecting something. Well, maybe Jesus has arisen. Maybe he's going to do now for the church what we expected, but he doesn't do it. But he does give them a commission. And notice what it says here in Matthew 28, verse 16. The Bible says, then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some, what? But some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and what? Teach, Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end <coughs> of the world. Here Christ says, all power is given unto me in heaven. Your commission and your duty now is to go to how many of the nations? All the nations. Now, the disciples were very slow in fulfilling this commission. Prejudice and what they thought needed to happen still kind of confused their minds. Now, I want us to notice. Let us go in our Bibles to the book of Acts. Let's go to Acts chapter one. Let us go in our Bibles to the book of Acts. Chapter one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Acts chapter one. Here Christ again is is emphasizing the the position that the disciples are to take now that their beloved leader is about to be taken up from them and he's about to go back into heaven and uh, the disciples are again their minds are still a little frazzled as to what all of these events spell now god has opened their understanding and they have been able to see christ and throughout all the prophecies of the Old Testament, and they understand without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was the Messiah and he died on time. He rose on time. Everything was fulfilled as it ought to. They even saw that their denial of Christ was prophesied. God said he would smite the shepherd and the sheep would be scattered. They saw this denial of Jesus. And now Peter and all Peter has been reinstated. Uh, because of his denial and everyone seems to be on one accord for all intents and purposes. And yet Jesus is now is about to lead them out to Bethany and he's bringing them here. And as he's coming, there's a question that is asked. The Bible says, um, beginning in verse three, verse. Hmm, I saw it in verse four, verse four. It says, and being assembled together with them, this is Jesus, and he, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the what? Promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me, for truly John baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence, verse six. And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him saying, Lord, will thou at this time do what? Restore, Restore again the kingdom to Israel. It goes on, verse seven. And he saith unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father hath put in his own power. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. 
here Jesus again is spelling out for them, not only for them, but for the church all the way to the end of the world, to the end of the age, that their commission is to go throughout the earth. This commission or gospel commission to go to the world has never been rescinded. God has never rescinded this commission. He has never uh, uh, indicated that this has been suspended until harsher laws are passed that is going to restrict you and then you're to go. He's never rescinded the commission. It, has, it is always there. What we have done is we have said, well, we need to spend more time in the church than we do in the world. We need to spend more time trying to get the church ready for a national Sunday law than we do with getting the world. But this is man's interpretation. And as a result of this interpretation, many who profess present truth have left off the commission of going to the world, of telling others about Jesus, helping them to understand what it means to be free from sin. Now, someone who grew up in the church, the safe confines of the church, I could almost, to some extent, understand why they don't feel the necessity to tell others who have never heard the gospel, the gospel. Because they have always grown up in the safety net of the church. But those who have, who have come from the outside, those who know what it's like to be ransomed from the jaws of the enemy, it is, it, is, it is almost foolish for them to believe that God is waiting for a law to pass for someone to receive the gospel to be free from sin. That, all, that, 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 that God is waiting for Congress to somehow come together and pass a law before we can go to someone and show them the power of the gospel so that they can be freed from the, from the, the, the destroying habits of sin. So the commission that God has given to us as a people has never been rescinded. And this commission, again, collectively, while the body is to be participate in it, each and every one of us individually must receive and accept the commission that comes with being a part of the body of Christ. Are we still together? Amen. Watch this. Notice what it says. He says, and to go into all Samaria. So now God has given them a commission and they were to go into all of Jerusalem, Judea and all of Samaria. And all of a sudden, uh, as we go down, we find that Matthias was brought into the fold. Uh, Matthias uh, 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 took over the place that Judas had lost because of transgression. And so as Judas fell, they said, Lord, of these men that have followed us, followed us all this time, which one do you want? Notice what it says. It says here in Acts chapter one, let's stay there. Acts chapter one, let's start in verse 20. Acts chapter one, looking at verse 20. The disciples come together. They're praying. They're in the upper room, not um, by themselves. The Bible says there's about 120 people with them. Um, and it says that James, the Lord's brother, was also among them. But we're jumping down to verse 20. It says, for it is written in the book of Psalms. This is Peter speaking. It is, <clears throat> excuse me, in the book of Psalms. Let his habitation be desolate. Let another, let no man dwell therein and his bishopric or his office in ministry, let another take. Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that our Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the what? Baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be what? Ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Verse 23. And they appointed to Joseph called Barsabas, whose surname is Justice and what? Matthias. So now, what is the Bible telling us? 
Peter says, they were with us since the baptism of John, but yet God had not appointed them as one of the twelve. Are you with me? So Jesus had, there were other disciples. There were other, there were other ones there, but the twelve he had appointed. And here was Justice, and here was Matthias. And they said, Lord, we, we remember the last time we wanted somebody among us, and it, was ju- and it was Judas. And we almost got ourselves in trouble. So we're not going to make that foolish mistake again. Lord, which of these men have what? You chosen. The criteria is they're going to have to bear witness of the resurrection. They understand your working. They, they were there as you went in and out among us. Which one, Lord, have you chosen? And we know the lot fell upon Matthias. And then the Bible says, and justice was sent home. But this was not the end of justice. You'll see later on in the book of Acts. And so now chapter two, they're all together in one place. And what happens? Spirit of God falls on them. Pentecost take place. People are baptized. And I want us to keep moving now. I want us to keep moving. And I want us to come to chapter six. I want us to move and go to chapter six. I want us to go here to chapter six. <clears throat> because I'm, I'm, I want to bring us to the point of understanding that collectively we have a work to do. And I think that that part is somewhat easy. We can see that part, but individually we have to understand that there's a work that God wants to give to us or that God has appointed for us. There's a work individually that we must see that God will give us his spirit to perform. And this individual work does not take away from the collective work as a body. Notice what it says. You're an Acts. Chapter six, Acts chapter six. Here we find the disciples coming to another critical point in the ministry. God had begun. He had laid the foundation for his church. And all of a sudden we find in Acts chapter two, we didn't read it, but they were baptized. And 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 God, the Bible says, added unto the church daily such as should be saved. Now, as he's adding on to this church, of believers in Acts chapter two, we have to understand that the 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 uh, Jerusalem, the the synagogues, probation had not closed yet, has it? No. Probation had not closed, but yet the Bible says that God was adding to the what church daily, such as should be saved. He wasn't sending them to Annas and Caiaphas. He wasn't sending them to, to, uh, uh, to Joseph of Arimathea. He wasn't sending them to Nicodemus. He was sending them to those that had placed themselves in a position where God was able to pour out his Holy Spirit on that congregation. This is what God was adding to daily, such as should be saved. We know that the disciples were not uh, uh, going to being called to the council meetings with Ananias and Caiaphas. When they were called, they were commanded that they shouldn't preach. They were told that, listen, you are filling Jerusalem with what? Your doctrines. The church doesn't espouse these teachings. These teachings are yours. And we're commanding you that you must stop preaching. Peter says, hey, we must obey God rather than men. So they didn't relinquish preaching. They continued to preach. God continued to add to the church daily such as should be saved. And so here we find in Acts chapter six, a problem happened. And the Bible says in Acts six, verse one. And in those days when the numbers of the disciples were what? Multiplied. There arose a murmuring <coughs> of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily ministration. Then the 12 called the multitude of the what? Disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look you out among you seven men. Notice, what does it say? Honest report. 
Now, who did he look to for uh, uh, to choose these men? He looked among the people. But the Bible specifically calls the multitude what? Disciples. Specifically calls them disciples. And so he, when he calls these disciples together. He calls these uh, those who, are, who have been influenced by the gospel. And he calls them among them and he says, listen. We need you to look among yourselves and we need you to pick seven men. And then the Bible goes on to say <clears throat> that they had to be men of what? Honest report. <clears throat> Meaning again, they couldn't be someone that people got false with and they, they owe this person in the church and they owe that person and they bought this and they bought that. And they say, well, no, nah, uh, you can't pick. Why? She, she owes me money and she hadn't paid me. And then someone looks up and say, well, she owes me money, too. You. Yeah, she bought. Well, I gave her some money yesterday. I gave him some money. It, 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 they had to have an honest report. Someone that was well trusted, like we said before, couldn't be like Ishmael. Couldn't have his hand against every man and every man's hands could not be against him. They had to be of honest report and they had to have the what? What does it say? The Bible says, and they had, and it says on a report, and then it, it didn't say just Holy Ghost, did it? It says full. He had to be full of the Holy Ghost. And what is he saying? They had, their life had to bear testimony that the Spirit of God was in their life. They had to be bearing fruit to the glory of God, because that's how we see if we have the Holy Spirit by the fruits that we bear by the character traits that we bear. So these were individuals that had to be chosen that manifested all of these things, but they don't have a position yet. Are you with me? They don't have a position in the church, but they have to be of honest report and their life had to be bearing fruit to the glory of God. And we are told, brothers and sisters, that when we are converted, no sooner will we begin to tell others about Jesus. So our lifestyle had to already be of such that others are being affected by the workings of the Spirit of God that's already in our lives. What is it telling us? That means that just because you're not a preacher doesn't mean you can't have the Holy Ghost. Doesn't mean you can't have uh, be full of the Holy Spirit while sitting in the pew. You read in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 18, the Bible says Apollos was mighty in the scriptures, but a Priscilla and Aquila had to sit him down and show him the way of the Lord more perfectly. These were two people sitting down and says, yeah, wow. Yeah, he seems like he has a lot of talent. That's, yeah, mm, yeah, I, we'll talk to him afterwards. And he finished preaching and they said, you, can we talk to you, Apollos? Yes, and he sat him down and he was humble enough to listen to people show him Jesus. To show him what he did not understand. He didn't rise up and say, what are you talking about? I got a degree. I went to seminary. I sat under John the Baptist. Who are you? But they sat there. He said, wow. Oh, seriously. And the Bible says he left there preaching Jesus. So it doesn't mean that when you have the Holy Ghost that all of a sudden, but it shows that, hey, we don't have to be up here to receive the Holy Spirit. We don't need to have an office to have God give us a full outpouring of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah, amen. Praise the Lord for that. So the Bible says that he had to have that they had to be full of the Holy Ghost and what? Wisdom and wisdom. Because he that winneth souls, the Bible says, is wise. It takes wisdom and tact to be able to have the ability to know how to preach in season, out of season. How to reprove, how to reprove and rebuke with all long suffering. And doctrine. 
how, how to turn a person from their evil ways and hide a multitude of sins. This is what God, this is what we have to have in order to occupy the positions of trust, of standing before the people. This is one of the, these are the, some of the qualities. It is expanded on by Paul in, uh, later on, but these are the qualities that we, that a person must possess. The same way that even as we sit in the pew and all of a sudden someone is appointed over you, you have to make sure that these are the qualities that are being exemplified. If they're not, then you have to be able to pull a person aside and see, yes, I see that there's a zeal and earnestness about your ways, but this is what you lack, young man. This is what you lack. And this is what God desires to impart to you if you would be successful. If they are unwilling to listen, then brothers and sisters, chances are they shouldn't be in the position. But this is something that we all must understand. Wherever we are or find ourselves, we must know who is it that has been appointed as leaders in the movement of God. Because these days, everybody is appointing themselves. The Lord woke me up this morning and told me I was to preach. Because we can get a camera, and because we can get a YouTube page, and because we could get a Facebook page, all of a sudden we have, a, we have a ministry now. And we have people following us. And this is what we have to be very careful of. Amen? Notice. So here the Bible says, this is what they must be appointed. These are the ones that must be appointed. And then the Bible says, in verse three again, wherefore, brethren, look ye out among yourselves. Brethren simply means church. Look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, wisdom, whom we may appoint over this what? Business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man, what? Full of faith. And what else? So, all right. So now, when they appointed him, he received faith in the Holy Ghost. No, he, he was already demonstrating this. And they said, I know a man, Stephen. Stephen didn't appoint himself. The multitude said, I know a man. And they went and grabbed him. They said, Stephen. Then it goes on and it says, and Philip. And you say that word. Prochorus. Amen. I've been stumbling over that since. And what's the next word? Come on, say it. Someone say it. Nicanor, Nicanor. Um, <laughs> yeah, Ni Nicanor. And Timon. And... Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. What does it mean to be a proselyte? Convert. Convert. Antioch. Antioch was in Syria. All right. So he was a convert and he accepted uh, the gospel that was taught by Christ and the various other individuals. So he is a convert from uh, from outside, from the Gentile world. He's a convert. Verse six. These are the individuals, it says, whom they sent before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word, now watch what was the result of putting these individuals in place. And the word of God, what? And the number of the disciples, what? in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were what? So as a result of these individuals now being put in place, the work did what? It increased. It multiplied. And this is what, and this is a testimony that the Spirit of God was leading because as a, work, as a result of this, more problems were not created. The Word of God, the Word of God began to increase more and more. And so what should our influence in the work of God should cause it to do what? Increase, not cause problems. 
this is what our appointments should do. Now notice, and then it goes on and talks about Stephen. Now the point we were making, or the point to be made here, is out of these seven, you own, after this chapter, you only hear about Philip and Stephen. Philip and Stephen are the only two of these seven that we hear about after this chapter. The other five, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith and of an honest report, continued to go about their daily duties and you never heard anything about them. You don't find them preaching. You don't find them doing anything that becomes prominent in the work. But we do know that they began, but souls are being added. Amen. We know that people were joining the faith, but you don't see anything else about them. So again, the appointment of the position didn't bring some public prominence. It brought others that were on the outside. So that shows that there were, yes, they took care of the daily do deeds and needs of the church, but they went out and they were bringing others to Christ. They continued to do the work of God and you saw nothing from them. Again, our commission is not about here. I've told someone before, someone asked and they said, can we have a concert? I said, yes, pick a corner. Pick any corner you want and we're going to have a concert. They looking all funny. I said, because chances are all the songs that you would sing from the hymn, though, I've heard them. I have them on my, I have a CD, but there are people who have never heard them. So if we do one, how about we do it outside and let's invite the community to come? Well, that's not the concerts generally that people want to do. They want to come inside the church and they want to sing songs that people have heard already. When our mission and our purpose is to influence others. When in the book of Second Chronicles, when they were about to go out, Jehoshaphat, the Lord said he told Jehoshaphat to do what first? What, he had, what did he put in the front? He put the choir out front. Let the world hear the music. Let them hear something different. But those who appointed to sing inside the sanctuary, the, uh, the Bible says they prophesied on those instruments. They wrote music. They understood music. They knew exactly what was appropriate to be sung because they knew who God was. They were singing in the presence of God. God was going to dwell in the most holy place. And brothers and sisters, some of this stuff that people are singing today, you can sing that in the sanctuary. You'll be smitten down singing that stuff. People are like, yeah, David danced. Yeah, but he was outside the sanctuary. He wasn't dancing in the church. He was out there praising God, but he wasn't doing that stuff we do today. But he wasn't doing it in a church. And so the reality is, when we understand God, there are a lot of things that we wouldn't even bring in. There are a lot of things that we wouldn't even permit. You know your parents. You have friends. They come over. Hey, what about? Oh, no, 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 no. We can't do that here. Mm -mm. Uh, no, no, we can't. Let's, let's go outside and let's talk. Hey, 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 hey my parents are inside. You got, oh, come, come on, let's go outside because you're going to get me in trouble. So if we know God, there are certain things that we will not bring before him. Let's look at this point. Chapter seven. We know what happened in chapter seven. Maybe we don't. But in chapter seven, you find Stephen in chapter six. <clears throat> Let me just read something about Stephen. Jump down to verse eight. Verse eight, chapter six, verse eight. And let's get to our point. The Bible says, and Stephen, full of faith and what? Power. He did great wonders and what? Miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, and of, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia. And they came to do what? Dispute Stephen. And they were not able they were not able to resist the 
wisdom and the spirit by which he spake can be a novice when it comes to the word of God. Here these individuals came and they said, listen, we need to go down there and we need to talk to this young man. He's part of this little offshoot movement. And we need to counsel with him because, you know, he 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 shows great zeal and 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 people really like him. And I think if we can just talk to him, then we can save him from this offshoot church that he's a part of. And they came down and they said, hey, let's talk to Stephen because he's a part of an offshoot movement. And they began to try to show him. But the Bible said they were not able to resist the wisdom by which he spake. He confounded them. All of these seminary students and scholars and people from the conference and the, the churches and the pastors and the supporting ministries came and sat down with him, but they were not able to. He was able to show him from the word of God. That the way that God had placed him in was the right way and that Christ and this truth, this was a truth for this time and they were not able. And so eventually they killed him in chapter seven. But notice what happens in chapter eight. As a result of this, chapter eight, chapter eight, we're still talking about our commission. Chapter eight, verse one, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at the same time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Which church is this? Caiaphas church? No, not Caiaphas church, not the church they were over, but what church? The Lord church that God was able to pull his Holy Spirit out on a great persecution came as a result of their influence. It says, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and what? Samaria, what? Except the apostles. Verse two, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Verse four, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere doing what? Preaching the word of God. Now notice verse five. Then Philip did what? Went down to the city of Samaria. And what did he do? Christ unto them. Wait a minute. The point here is Steve, what was Philip's office? He was a deacon. Now he goes down to Samaria. Do you think he just said, woke up one morning, had a dream and said, I want to go to Samaria. This was a part of the commission. Jesus says, you're going to preach into all Judea round about Jerusalem and in Samaria. This was part of the commission. And so Philip being moved upon, remember, they were full of the what? Holy Ghost. And he went down and he preached in Samaria. Now, he was not sent there by the church. The brethren didn't come together and agree for Philip to go down and preach in Samaria. This was a divine mission. God sent him there to preach. And he went down there and he preached Jesus. And the Bible goes on to say, let's see what was the results, verse six, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did for the unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and many taken with palsy and that were lame were healed. And there was what? Great joy in the city. Now you'll read later on, I believe it's in Acts chapter 21, that Philip had a family. He had four daughters mentioned specifically that also prophesied. He had a family. So the reality is, oh, oh, because I said the daughters. <laughs> so the reality is he, he had four daughters that prophesied. Amen. Yes. So, Amen. 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 It's okay. It's okay. They had four daughters that prophesied. Praise the Lord. Brothers and sisters, you know that the Lord, the prophet of the Lord said that women will go into the, will go into a home and can do a greater work than a man can do. There are things that women can do that men can never do. Man walk in the house and you holding his wife because she crying, you get in trouble. 
Now you there, give him the Bible study, and all of a sudden she break down, start crying. You like, sister, it's okay. He walks in, it's gonna be trouble. But she could do it all day long. I've I've gone to people's houses and studied with them and can't get them to come. And all of a sudden, the sister go there and get the whole family, husband, brothers, uncle, everybody there. They can do a great work. So here, Philip goes down, and Philip is having great success. Now, the Bible doesn't indicate that he's down there with anybody. He goes down there by himself and he's doing the work that he can. He's bringing people together to hear the gospel. <clears throat> the point is, when we talk about doing, following and doing God's work and we be about being called to do God's work, we have to be able, we have to understand that we must be able to do the work that we have the ability to do. You go to a city and you say, well, wow, yeah, look at these people here. I need to bring them together and I need to find a meeting place. No, you don't. Just talk to the people, share with them. If they will hear you on the street, you could stop two or three people. They could be sitting down and say, hey, wait a minute, you, you got a minute. I, I need to share something with you all. And they say, share what? what do you, did you know judgment started? Judgment. What are you talking about the judgment? Do you know the Bible says that fear God, give glory to him for the hour of the judgment has come. You know, right now we're living in the judgment and you got these three people standing around you and you just preach to them and you just tell them what you know and, they, and you leave them with something. You don't have to go down there and say, man, I'm going to start a church and I'm going to try. No, 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 no. You, you, you're getting yourself into trouble. But this is what Stephen did. And Stephen, went, uh, pardon me, this is what Philip did. He went down to Samaria and he preached and he told them about Jesus. And he also performed miracles. Why? Because he had the Holy Ghost. God gave him this ability. And brothers and sisters, understand with the commission and with the receiving of God's Holy Spirit, God wants to give us power to be able to cast out unclean spirits. It's not fictitious. It's not waving of a wand, but God literally wants to, not spiritually, he's not waiting for some time in the future. God wants to give us power because there are people who are possessed with unclean spirits and we're sitting there trying to uh, 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 do things for them, but the demons need to be cast out. We want them to stop smoking, but brothers and sisters, they are controlled by an unclean spirit. You can't give them a nicotine pack. You can't get, uh, get the devil off that. You can't uh, uh, nicotine the devil with a nicotine pack and get him to leave somebody. He's not going to leave because they're on nicotine chewing gum. We need power to cast out those unclean spirits. And this is what God wants to give to us. This is part of the commission. Yes, pr preaching and, and proclaiming the gospel, but God giving us power to be able to put our hands on someone and pray and rebuke that spirit that is possessing that young lady that has her in that lifestyle. We can't Bible study all the time somebody out of sin. We have to have power. Cast out those unclean spirits. Why? So that they now can hear the gospel. They will be willing to listen because that demon has been rebuked. But we can't sit there and try to talk with them and the devil. And this is why we have to study and look at the life and the ministry of Jesus and pray that his ministry becomes a part of ours. Notice this. Here it is. So here he is. He's down there. He's preaching. And then all of a sudden, it goes on and it says in verse nine, but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery. He bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one to whom they were all. They all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying this is the great power of God. And on him and to him they had regard because that of a long time he had what? Bewitched them. Bewitched them with sorcery. But when they believed, but when they believed Philip's preaching, the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, they were what? Baptized both men and women. So was Philip's ministry effective? It was effective. 
He baptized people. He was commissioned to baptize. He was down there by himself baptizing. As you continue to read later on, you find that John and Peter came and the Holy Spirit fell on them. And then all of a sudden Simon said, I want to buy the Holy Spirit. Peter rebuked him. Notice what it says here in Acts chapter 8. Stay in Acts 8 and let's jump down now in verse 25. Verse 25. All right. He says, and after all, he, after Peter rebuked um, Simon Magus, and they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And verse 26, and the church came together and spake unto Philip. Verse 26 of Acts chapter 8, what does it say? And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Rise, go toward what? The south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is the desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, had come, had come to Jerusalem for to worship, and was returning, and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then, verse 28, 29, the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this one. Chariot. Once again, God gives Philip singular his commission. Philip was just standing with Peter and John in Jerusalem. They were just together. God could have spoke to Peter and John and told Philip what to do. But they went back towards Jerusalem and God said, no, 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 you don't go towards Jerusalem. You go south. I have a work for you to do down there. And what did Philip do? Listen to the Spirit of God. Went down to Gaza and finds himself sitting in front of this rich Ethiopian man. The man just came from Jerusalem worshiping. And he left Jerusalem and still didn't know who Jesus was. He's reading Isaiah and he says, wow, who is this? Who, who is this man? Is, is, this, is it the prophet that's speaking or is it some other person? You just came from church and you still don't know who Christ is. He says, and then Philip gets up in the chariot and shows him who Jesus is. And what does, and as they move forward, he said, notice what the man says, moving forward, in verse 36, and as they went on their way, there came unto a certain, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth what? Hinder me to be baptized. And Philip said, I need to go and get the brethren first. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, What? I believe Jesus is what? If you can believe all that you have just heard, if you have accepted the fact of who Jesus is, because in order for him to know who Jesus, Philip had to start from the beginning and show him Christ. Show him his workings among men. Do you believe? I believe. You can be baptized. And Philip got down and baptized him. The purpose is, the point of it is, God has given a divine commission to his body, to his church. Individually, each and every one of us has a responsibility in fulfilling the commission. Every one of us. And today, as we, move, as we look forward into a new year, as we look forward and saying, wow, the things that we need to do for God and the things that God wants us to do, guess what? We all can have have an honest report among them all men. We all can be full of the Holy Ghost. We all can have that wisdom that is needed because the entire body of Christ needs it, brothers and sisters. Not just 
Oh, it's time for us to select a deacon now, and we need to get an elder here, and we need to, get, brothers and sisters, we all need to recognize the position that God is calling each and every one of us to participate in. As the needs arise, then those positions arise, and there are those who will have to occupy those places. For what purpose? Just saying that they're an elder? Just saying that they're a deacon? Or forwarding the work of God? It's for forwarding the work. It's for, it's for so that the word of God can be, can grow. So that God can feel comfortable in bringing people to the church. Not just to hear an individual, but that they could come and be edified by our fellowship and by the word of God. Even to the point where they could be edified if they have to come to your house to study. Amen. They have to come to your house and hear you. This is what God is looking and endeavoring and desiring to do for his entire church. So when trying to reach the world, it starts with the gospel having its effect upon us, having its place and its work in each and each and every one of our lives. Because yes, there's a work, there's a, a work, there's a work for the body to participate in. But it is not to look at these positions of leadership of disciples and think that, you know, the disciples is talking about the Bible worker. It is talking about the evangelist. It's talking about the uh, apostle or the prophet. No, God is talking about each and every one of us. He'll give us a spirit and he'll show us how to win people to him. He'll show us how to have an influence with others because that's what's needed now. The world is not getting any better, is it? Riots, protests are, are of a frequent occurrence, we are told, to the point where the world has been brought into anarchy. But it is only the mercy of God holding the four winds, saying, don't blow until my servants are sealed in their foreheads. And so while we're sitting or some are sitting waiting for this seal, they're not going to receive it. Because God is holding the winds for his people to work. The work begins in here, but it doesn't stay in here. It has its effect upon those around us. And what we can start doing is start thinking about, Lord, all the people that I come in contact with throughout the week, all the people that I sit with in my break room, is anybody in here desires to know about you? Is there anybody in here who wants to know how to pray? There was a young lady, and I remember going with, going to her home with one of the Bible workers. <clears throat> and we would always say, hey, remember to pray for us. Pray for us. She would always say, yes, yes, I'll pray for you. And then one day, the young lady was, was leaving and she said, hey, pray for us. And the, lady, and the young girl stopped her, said, how do you pray? It's a, a month passed, two months passed of her saying, yes, I'll pray for you. But it got to the point where she says, how do you pray? I don't know how to pray. And the person was shocked almost to tears and sat down with the person and talked to, talked to her about prayer. There are people around us, brothers and sisters, that, would, that, that want to pray, but how do they pray? They're grown up Catholic. They don't know how to commune with God. They don't know that God, like the song was sung earlier, uh, um, <clears throat> what a friend we have in Jesus. Many people have never received Jesus as a friend. They go to church every week. And they sit next to us in our cubicles. They, they, they work with us at our stations. And yet they have never accepted Christ because no one has ever asked them, do they want to? It's not that they're averse to, to, to Christianity. Don't believe the hype. Most people are not listening to all this stuff that's being broadcast over the television. A lot of people don't have time to watch television. Some people are crying out for something different. Some people are driving past churches, believe it or not, wanting to go in, but not having the courage. 
and they come back to work with you. And if you would just simply ask them, have you ever read your Bible before? And they say, no, I have one, but I just never thought to read it. You mind if I give you something, just something short, it'll help you understand your Bible. Thank you. It will go a long way. Problems arise. Hey, do you mind if I ask you a question? All started because we showed an interest in their spirituality. We must ask God to give us that type of love and desire for people that we see around us every Amen. single day. Just to say something to them about Christ. Not like we go through the grocery line, have a blessed day. No, something more of substance that will make them say, hmm, I'll think about that. Sow those seeds so that when harvest time comes, guess what? There's something to gather in. There's something to gather. Father in heaven, <coughs> Lord, there are people not only longing to be saved, but there are others who are longing to know how to save others. Mm -hmm.